do, da Universidade de Manitoba, no Canadá, e coordenadora do Center for Globalization and Cultural Studies da mesma universidade. Tá? É, então, eu passo a palavra para ela agora. Obrigada e bom dia. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I too would like to thank the organizers, especially Vanderlei and Roberto, uh, Karina, Amelia, and the many students who have put so much work uh, into this event. Uh, I think you can see that we have a Portuguese translation on this side and some visuals and a few key English words on the other side. So I'm starting by saying that the paper is based on a few propositions, statements I'm exploring. Number one, research production and dissemination, teaching from that research, are changing their character with the rise of digital technologies and social media and the changing needs of globalizing societies. Learning communities are now becoming recognized as co-producers of knowledge. So we are interested in working with you. We need to hear your feedback, your questions, and the interaction throughout the next two days. The notion of all of us as co-producers of knowledge, as you know, was developed by Paulo Freire years ago, but it is now entering mainstream thinking through thinking about what digitization enables. Collaboration, complexity, and creativity are the key components of new learning cultures. These prioritize learning, participation, and process over teaching, reception, and content. They valorize autonomy. In some ways, these trends are to be welcomed, and in others, they require further investigation. We don't know what implications they will have. So point number two, in learning a discipline, students also learn a form of academic literacy that designates their personal sense of the public readerships associated with that discipline, the audience for that work. And students need to learn these specialized languages, but they also need to learn to communicate across them. National cultures also operate according to similar principles. So establishing connections across these borders becomes a priority in a globalizing world. So the Brazil-Canada project is working to establish those connections and these next two days as well. Number three, given the widespread belief that interdisciplinarity is increasingly necessary to address the complexity of problems in an interdependent world. Researchers in the post-colonial humanities, my field, need to address more carefully questions about how to make interdisciplinary work for our learning agendas, for our values, our priorities, which are not necessarily, which are unlikely to be the same as those of a neoliberal imaginary. So number four, the tendency to separate teaching and research in public discourse about education today needs to be questioned. An understanding of the ways in which new learning cultures integrate learning, training, and research will be essential as humanities disciplines reinvent themselves to meet the challenges of an interdependent world. 
So these four principles provide the basis for the future collaborative work that I'm conducting with colleagues here in Sergipe and in other parts of Brazil and Canada. And it's great to see people here from other parts of Brazil today. This research is still at an exploratory stage. My newly published book, co-edited book, called Crosstalk, Canadian and Global Imaginaries in Dialogue, asks this question. How do readers negotiate meaning in contexts where norms of understanding diverge? Our team spent the last two days talking about this question. I'm still working it through. We know norms of understanding work within cultural, linguistic, regional, and social contexts. Digital engagements complicate the situation even further. But to focus on the digital alone would be a mistake. Digital engagements also need to be situated within these larger contexts. We can't look at them through a technological or instrumental lens alone. So we have to understand them contextually because they raise questions about what we mean by literacy and how literacy can best be achieved in different situations. So my talk today is partly a report based on a decade of research collaboration within several large teams organized to bring together different groups around a shared set of goals. The SHRC funded major collaboration, uh, Globalization and Autonomy, began in 2001 and should be finishing this year with the publication of the capstone volume to our eight book series with the University of British Columbia Press. The Ford Foundation funded Building Global Democracy Project started in 2008 and will complete its first phase this year. The 10 members of this team, the democracy team, are planning to co-author the introduction and conclusion to our edited book to, called Toward More Inclusive Global Politics this summer. And then the SHRC funded Brazil-Canada uh, Partnership Development Project uh, that Vanderly mentioned, Building Transnational Literacies, began its three-year term last year. So in each project, we are learning to work across a challenging set of boundaries. We're still learning. Each one's designed with a digital component that has developed along with the technologies available. But none could be described as primarily digital in orientation. In the first two projects, the balance in digital engagement between communication and interaction was heavily skewed to the communicational function, one-way transmission. The focus of the more recent partnership project is more interactional. And this reflects the changes being opened up by um, new digital media today. So from these experiences, I remain cautiously optimistic about the promise of academic collaboration moving forward. But I do not share the more utopian predictions of media enthusiasts and researchers, for example, associated with the MacArthur Foundation publications that are freely available on the web, uh, mostly from 2007 or Duke University's Haystack Initiative, which also has a terrific website talking about learning in digital environments. Uh, I am convinced, though, that academic culture needs to change, and that digital collaboration, appropriately designed and executed, can help us contribute more effectively 
to think about how we can work together to address the challenges of our time and place. So in my experience, when research teams are trying to work together in interdisciplinary, transnational, and transsectoral partnerships, digital innovations are not yet at a stage to address most of the issues that require attention. Virtual and place-based initiatives need to continue cooperation and we need to ask more questions um, about process innovation, which is still in its infancy. Product innovation is happening faster. E-publishing is taking off. So are open access initiatives and I happily endorse both. So today's talk, that's the context, today's talk proceeds from here in four parts. First, I explore the idea of community as a contested social and political ideal, a practice continually in process, and a form of sociality that many believe is radically changing in response to emergent technological change. Secondly, and each section gets shorter, you'll be happy to hear. Secondly, I describe some of the institutional barriers to collaboration as I have experienced them. Thirdly, I explore the relationship between digital technology and academic collaboration. And finally, I'll conclude with a, a few questions that I think require further attention. So first, community, a contested ideal. Communities have traditionally been understood in bounded and place-based terms. Can digital technologies lead towards thinking more trans-communally? John Brown Child's book, Transcommunality, refers in its subtitle to moving from the politics of conversion to the ethics of respect. The politics of conversion characterize the age of European imperialism and settler colonialism, a period dominated by the expansionist politics of Christianity aligned with Enlightenment values and Western industrialism. Anti-colonial, decolonial, post-colonial, and indigenous theorizing each offers complementary and sometimes conflicting roots beyond the politics of conversion. So it was through the politics of conversion that Eurocentric values imposed themselves upon other ways of knowing. So reconceiving knowledge through drawing upon the wisdom of all peoples requires negotiation conducted through an ethics of respect. Canadian Sophie McCall concludes her investigation of the ethics of collaborative authorship with the reminder that collaboration, in her words, remains an uneasy and volatile process. Moments of cross-cultural misunderstanding, failures in cultural translation, and static in communication inform the relations of exchange imbricated in unequal social contexts. So an ethics of respect needs to acknowledge these difficulties without losing sight of the potential within collaborative practices for imagining more equitable ways of creating together. So in the introduction to their anthology called Prismatic Publics, Canadians Kate Eichhorn and Heather Mill express what I think is a newly dominant or hegemonic belief of our time. They argue that meaning is produced 
through the processes of circulation, recirculation, recombination, and procedure. And this work must be understood as enacting a poetics of flux, not stasis. So the idea that meaning should be fixed, so long associated with print media, is now under serious attack. It's an attack that worries some and energizes others. What will it mean for how we construct knowledge? Canadian poet Roy Mickey, in his collection of essays called In Flux, argues that if traditional notions of community have privileged stasis, staying in place and knowing one's place, then we start to ask what can this praise of community in flux tell us about how and why people interact and join together in shared projects today. So I'm suggesting that the, each discipline addresses these questions in its own specific ways. More efforts need to be made to share our work across disciplines. Investigating transnational literacies is alerting me to the need for those of us working in globalization, post-colonial, cultural, and literary studies to work more closely with colleagues in social linguistics, applied linguistics, language education, and community literacy studies. So Eleonora Long summarizes the question that animates community literacy studies. And she highlights this statement in her book. How do we engage issues of reading and writing, ethics and border crossings, in ways and in locales that will make a difference? She describes the field of community literacy studies as being interested in the power of institutions to define literacy. Institutions such as the school, the university, but also other institutions. She describes the field as focusing on the often tenuous connection between literacy and democracy. We'd like to think there's a connection, but people are wondering if this is true. And the field is interested in the potential for local publics to make a difference, to have some agency, some autonomy, in say about the direction their lives will take together. Nonetheless, her book, Community Literacy and the Rhetoric of Pu Local Publics, deliberately avoids addressing virtual activism or the employment of digital technologies. And she avoids talking about this in this book for two reasons. She says it's because virtual engagements will still require translation into action in the non-virtual world to achieve effective change. And she argues that because the field is an emergent area, it requires further study uh, before any kinds of conclusions can be drawn about how the virtual might be employed in these productive ways. So nonetheless, in digital environments, old questions take on new forms. What are the implications of digitization for learning communities? After a 20th century torn apart by manifestations of the darker side of community building through organized violence against perceived others, the 21st century is witnessing an intensification of such fears at the geopolitical level, at the same time as educators are celebrating the potential of new social media to enable new forms of online collaboration 
across older boundaries set by differences of time, space, identity, and language. So for all those who think that community is threatened by globalization, there are others who see real possibilities for strengthening community through these globalizing processes. Beyond these two extremes, there are others who seek to complicate that binary. I'm thinking of theorists such as Jean-Luc Nancy and Jacques Rancière. These theorists are trying to redefine community in more radical ways. They think community has been too tainted by its 20th century history to be usable anymore. Um, so Rancière offers us the model of dissensus. So we have to stop thinking in terms of consensus, which he thinks of as um, associated with coercion, and start talking about valuing dissensus. Disagreements are okay, though we may want to work through them together. Um, so Jean-Luc Nancy talks about replacing permanent senses of belonging with temporary solidarities and contingent forms of what he calls being together. So he uses being together as a replacement for community. It's a more active way of thinking about community as always in process, always being made and remade. So popular metaphors for describing digitally mediated interaction to form these new kinds of community include those of conversation and dialogue. So in Prismatic Publics, Canadian author and poet uh, Nicole Brassard distinguishes between conversation and dialogue in terms of the space they provide for movement and in terms of their effective requirements for meeting different kinds of goals. So Brassard remarks, trust and confidence and listening are necessary in a conversation. Just as sharpness, knowledge, and processing are more in a dialogue. She concludes, however, that the key to both is relationship, and that what is being exchanged and what circulates through that relationship. So our Globalization and Autonomy Steering Committee selected the metaphor of conversing across disciplines to title our capstone volume for the series. And throughout the project, we've reminded ourselves about um, Anna Singh's characterization of global interactions as occurring across zones of awkward engagement, where words mean something different across a divide, even as people agree to speak and listen. So Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor had earlier identified the sphere of interdisciplinary conversation as engaging zones of puzzlement. So zones of awkward engagement, zones of puzzlement within which we tend to lose our bearings Oops. and talk across purposes. So our project was one such zone. And building global democracy as well has introduced further complications, moving it into a more fully transsectorial and multilingual realm. Now, with Brazil-Canada exchange, uh, we've tried to build a more manageable focus, only two languages, only two countries, um, only a few sectors. Um, nonetheless, there are many challenges we face. 
Among these are institutional, ideological, and philosophical barriers to collaboration that operate differently in our two countries, but that operate in both places. And they also operate within disciplines and universities. So this takes me to my, whoops, 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 yes, this is our second point. Um, this gives you a moment of humor. No sound, but. The video is accompanied by classical music, if you check it out on the web. And I hope you get the idea that it's a reference to the notion of silos. You know, disciplinary enclaves that operate in isolation from each other. So this is one way. <laughs> Um, crossing those silos or moving beyond that way of thinking in terms of bounded relationships. Moving toward thinking about collaborative relationships and the barriers that stop them from interacting. I'm, I'm suggesting that for us, people concerned with literacy that conventions around the idea of the book can block interaction in zones of engagement from reaching audiences for print-based communication. And that the digital world enables us to break down some of those barriers. Much of the university world remains wedded to the idea of the book as expressing a linear argument. And in the humanities, the book remains the privileged form of communication. If a book has more than one author, must it express a uniform vision? Most peer reviewers still think it should. And if it does not, what makes it a book rather than a collection of disconnected essays? Despite what Leotar hailed as the death of master narratives many years ago, the single voice text with a single argument to make remains the norm in academic scholarship. So in contrast, the Globalization and Autonomy Project found our, quest, found our focus in the questions we were asking more than in trying to find any kind of stable answer. That was partly because our answers were deeply rooted in particular times and places, leading us to avoid premature closure or homogenizing generalizations. So I was not willing to provide a conventional conclusion to the book Renegotiating Community because our work suggested that community is always in process, continually formed and reformed through negotiation in particular circumstances so that the shapes community takes and the values it embraces are not likely to be uniform or true for all times or places. So this is a form of conclusion that leaves the definition of community open. It remains subject to the jointly determined decisions of those within it. But even negotiation is not a universally shared value or even a universally acknowledged term. When the book was translated into Chinese, I'm told by friends, and I do need to check this, but I'm told by friends that the Chinese title is closer to critical reflections on community. Still a good title, 
but it does lose that notion of negotiation and renegotiation. So I am arguing we need to pay more attention to these questions of translation, the histories words carry within particular contexts and how they change their meaning when they travel. And we saw a similar issue around our key word, autonomy. There is a Chinese word for autonomy, but it does not appear to carry the same kinds of historical and ideological resonances in Chinese that it carries within Western traditions. Uh, this is important because autonomy is one of those key words within education studies today um, that carries a lot of these Western assumptions uh, into the classroom. With Building Global Democracy, we encountered similar frictions around many of our keywords. We had intensive discussions around what does building mean? What does global mean? What does democracy mean? Um, there were objections to the word materialism or material. Um, pretty well every word we used when we began to discuss across the 10 global regions who were part of our project in the many languages involved, eight uh, languages are on the website. This, we found that this is going to be the future if we are going to successfully imagine productive forms of global community. So we need to work through these differences. Uh, it's helpful if we can find points of commonality, understand the sources of our differences with sensitivity and respect, and sometimes we may need to agree to disagree. We may, may need to set priorities. So our projects deliberately brought people together who did not agree with each other who came from different traditions, different philosophical traditions, different national, cultural traditions. Because we wanted to see what would happen as we learned to share our different views and try to learn to appreciate the different places others were coming from. And many of us did change our views uh, as we learned more about our colleagues who were coming out of different disciplinary and ideological traditions. So in a similar spirit, the concluding chapter of our book, Renegotiating Community, advocates the value of what Bonnie Honig calls dilemmatic spaces. She has coined this English word from dilemma. Um, it's, it's like zones of puzzlement. Uh, but dilemmatic spaces are spaces where you are not sure what the best decision will be. She describes these as places where agency can be constituted through daily dilemmatic choices and negotiations. So um, in our 2012 collection, Crosstalk, Canadian and Global Imaginaries in Dialogue, Martin Javorak and I try to model a multi-voice text that confronts differences in approach to our topic head on. The book argues that the quest for a redefined vocabulary that can do justice to humanity-based collaborative work will involve renewed attention to crosstalk, a term we use to describe forms of discussion that can respect and learn from diversity. And although we don't cite it in the book, it is interesting that there's also a Chinese tradition around uh, crosstalk that conveys similar notions of flow and friction. So using the metaphor of crosstalk, we recognize the differences in methodology and foundational assumptions that currently separate different kinds of literary, theatrical, and cultural studies. And this is a model also endorsed 
by Linda Flower in her book, Community Literacy and the Rhetoric of Public Engagement. Flower suggests the traditional academic format can make it difficult to convey experiential insights, unresolved questions, are perspectives not well captured by formal prose. She continues, a multi-voiced inquiry, on the other hand, can design the text to reflect the shape of an inquiry, as well as different forms that knowledge takes. So two different ideas of writing, the single voice writing, the multi-voice inquiry. And I, I find this a productive model, but I, I note uh, other people do not. Um, Andrew Shyrock and Daniel Lord Smale's book, Deep History, The Architecture of Past and Present, chooses to move in the opposite direction. They say we decided not to produce single author chapters. Instead, we grouped ourselves by theme and tackled our subjects collectively, generating chapters that are genuinely transdisciplinary. So they write a multi-voice text that blends many voices into one communal voice. Uh, they say that by dissolving the monographic voice and developing a collaborative one in its place, we sought to escape the untidy polyphony that can mar collections of this kind. Um, well, I think our book Crosstalk um, has an untidy polyphony to it, and I enjoy untidy polyphony. I find it productive because I think it does leave spaces for other voices beyond those already performed within the text. But I can also see a place for what deep history is trying to achieve. My initial preference for the capstone volume to globalization autonomy, conversing across disciplines, had been to produce a polyphonic, multi-voiced volume. But I was persuaded to experiment in co-writing a volume within a single collaborative voice. And um, the discussions required to achieve this voice have been illuminating. I have learned a lot. Um, we share the hope that readers will hear unexpected intellectual harmonies in our volume. The collective writing has enabled us to go more deeply into our areas of misunderstanding clarifying without oversimplifying the arguments we are developing, unraveling the knots of disagreement that we found, and taking our collaboration to a higher level. It took more time, but once we worked through our disagreements, we found ways of saying things that were better than what we had initially proposed. Uh, but this was conducted, this work was conducted through email and face-to-face -face collaboration over two or three years. The one area where collaboration has proved less successful has been in our attempts to collaborate online. Um, and because time is running a bit short, um, I, I, will move, I won't elaborate the problems we had, but I will say that our current project you know, is exploring now with some of the new um, platforms, such as uh, Mendeley, that we hope can replace Skype, email, and Facebook to enable uh, more intense and regular intellectual exchange online as we move forward. Um, and I find when I wrote about this that the language of distinguishing these different modalities as real versus virtual no longer seem adequate to the world we live in today, but I think we are struggling to find an appropriate vocabulary to match these differently constituted realities. 
And that moves me to collaboration in digital context, my third uh, section. And uh, how are we doing for time? It's okay. Um, so on the one hand, I think it's true that digital theorist Alan Liu is right when he says that information technology is an institutional desiring engine an institutional desiring engine that could devour us all will certainly transform how we work and learn. Um, it's pulling us into a sphere. It's being actively promoted by our universities. Um, but on the other hand, while many academics have embraced social media, these function as complementary resources for our work rather than replacements for workshops or for conferences such as this. And I think the question is, we're not quite sure yet how we should frame the questions that are arising around collaboration in digital media. The dominant approach is to see it as purely technological. Let's find the best platform. We experimented with several, Adobe Connect, now we're trying Mendeley. So approach it as looking for a technological fix. Um, but we also need to think about it as a literacy issue. And a literacy issue with a difference. We bring insights from the new literacies into dialogue with post-colonial critique and Gayatri Spivak's call to develop transnational literacy. And transnationally is a complex term that means different things to different readers. Spivak warns us against using this term in a purely instrumental fashion. Yet many educators are beginning to adopt the term transnational literacies in exactly this way, to see it as purely um, a technical kind of question for enabling interaction uh, amongst multicultural groups of students in US-based classrooms. But our research team, on contrast, is trying to investigate a fuller potential of transnational literacies. Um, to engage deeper questioning about what the transnational and what literacy mean and what they can mean for learning communities moving forward. So as a provisional and short definition today, transnational literacies describe modes of meaning making that will be able to move from a politics of conversion to an ethics of respect, linking cognitive justice to social justice. These two complex terms that need to be unpacked. But in using transnational literacies as an expansive and contextualizing concept, I think that the Brazil Canada project is addressing some of the gaps that Alan Liu sees within the digital humanities as they are practiced today. And I'm referring to Alan Liu's 2011 article uh, because I think it's a good survey of where the field is at now and where it needs to go, some of the gaps within what's happening there. So it's called The State of the Digital Humanities, a Report and a Critique. Lou surveys a history in which separate approaches and fields have converged to give the humanities a new brand, the brand of the digital humanities. And this brand sells itself as providing a better fit with the post-industrial paradigm of knowledge work. Lucy strengths and weaknesses in this move. He sees challenges. He wants to see more engagement with social computing and communication studies. 
He wants digital humanities to move beyond the focus on big data alone toward learning to work across scales. He wants to see more attention to data aesthetics and their implications. And he wants more investigation of the context, economic, social, and institutional, in which this work takes place. And I see similar concerns shaping the 2011 special issue of the journal Culture Machine. This issue is devoted to moving beyond what they call the computational turn in the humanities. In the concluding essay, Gary Hall asks two questions about interdisciplinary reciprocity in this turn. One, along with the computational turn in the humanities, might we not also benefit from more of a humanities turn in our understanding of the computational and the digital. And number two, he asks to what extent it's possible to envisage digital humanities that go beyond the disciplinary objects, affiliations, assumptions, and methodological practices of computing and computer science. Two ways of asking the same question. How can this move, this interaction between computers and humanities, become more reciprocal, more equally balanced? So it's not just humanities taking from computer sciences and digital environments, but actually influencing how they develop the questions they ask and the work they can do. So he's asking the humanities, people like us, to think seriously about what we bring to interdisciplinary engagements. So he does distinguish between two related fields, the digital humanities and the computational turn in the humanities. And he worries that the computational turn currently dominates, even within the digital humanities. So the computational turn describes the process whereby techniques and methodologies drawn from computer science and related fields, interactive information visualization, statistical data analysis, science imaging, image processing, network analysis, data management, manipulation, and mining. This turn to all of these new ways of working, thinking, and asking questions are increasingly used to produce new ways of approaching and understanding tasks in the humanities. So how, however, is asking us to ask how digital engagements can help us question our central concepts. Concepts such as that of the scholar. Who is the scholar? What does the scholar do? Concepts such as writing. How do we recognize it when we see it? The book, the work, the discipline, the university. Each of these things uh, is being questioned, our understanding of what it means, how valuable it is, what it looks like, are now being questioned. So David Berry, in his opening essay, notes how computational technology has become the very condition of possibility required in order to think about the questions raised in the humanities today. Yet, the potential for questioning the founding assumptions of humanities scholarship and for interrogating these conditions of possibility has gone largely unrealized within the first wave, within the first two waves of digital humanities work. 
So digital humanities tends to use the new technology to do the same kind of work we've always done. People are saying it's now time to rethink the work we've always done and to ask what reading and writing actually mean in a computational age. For Barry, it would mean arguing that for critical understanding of the literacies of the digital, and through that critical understanding, developing a shared digital culture through a form of digital buildum. That would buildum hard to translate, so it's often just used in English as buildum borrowed from the German, but it helps us to think about identity formation. Um, how who we are is formed through um, education and literature. So for many, it remains the central task of the university, but needs to be redefined. Uh, it needs now to produce a different kind of person, a person who understands new methods and practices of critical reading. He itemizes these as code, data visualization, patterns, narrative, and a, a new kind of person who is open to new methods of pedagogy to facilitate it. So new kinds of teachers, new kinds of learners, um, new kinds of thinkers. And uh, these uh, require attention to some of the foundational questions that Todd Presner raised in his manifesto Digital Humanities 2.0. This is freely available on the web and you may wish to consult it. Presner notes that none of these digital tools are value neutral. And none of these technologies were designed by humanists or for humanists. It's beginning to change a bit, but this is still largely true. They were not designed for us or our uses. So Presner concludes, not only do we have to rethink how knowledge gets created, we also have to rethink what knowledge looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it tastes like. Who gets to create knowledge? When is knowledge done? When is knowledge transformed? How does knowledge get legitimated and authorized? And how can knowledge be made accessible to a broader audience, to a global audience? Well, this is a manifesto that sets an agenda. We're here to ask, how can we realize that agenda if we accept it? Or how would we set our own agenda in response to these questions? Um, I, I also cite again Alandra, who asks, what is the critical purpose of studying meaning in a digital environment which is characterized by the proliferation of meanings. She suggests we should focus less on signification, you know, less on finding some fixed meaning, some truth in the text, and more on the question of regimes, of the production and circulation of meaning. So more on um, the platforms through which digitized meaning is circulated and explored, and more on institutions such as schools. Um, she thinks we need to ask harder questions about the notion that pervasive, accessible, and instantaneous communication will necessarily equal better democratic action. We need to ask the same question about our schools. Will our literacy teaching in the classroom necessarily lead to better citizens, better democratic engagement? And she concludes that the question of meaning in a popular digital environment 
such as participatory media environments, is still a question of power. And attention to power then asks us to look at the governance and conditions, the zones of possibility through which specific meanings come to appear. She also suggests we need to think about software not as a tool, but as an actor. An actor that's also producing and distributing meanings, raising questions for us about how we can conceptualize the link between data and meaning, and the link between information and culture. So I, I think I'll skip the next paragraph where I talk about how Lou is also asking um, similar questions. Um, and focusing on the importance of looking at what N. Catherine Hales calls intermediation to describe the complex transactions between bodies and texts as well as between different forms of media. And we need to look at them in relation to the multiple causalities, complex dynamics, and emergent possibilities they afford us. So it matters that these questions are being asked and we are just beginning to think them through. I'm going to skip uh, another brief section and just sum up by saying that I am arguing that research, writing, and reading on the internet is rapidly changing how people work and how people read across disciplines and national boundaries, making transnational interaction more accessible. But at the same time, attitudinal and institutional barriers remain powerful. So in this paper, I've tried to open questions for your consideration, but I'm not offering any conclusions. I think the promise of interdisciplinary, international, and transsectoral partnerships is real, but also elusive. Collaboration depends on trust, and trust takes time and interpersonal contact to develop. In a world increasingly devoted to speed and standardized measurements of productivity, creative experiments in partnership development that challenge stereotypical beliefs face many challenges, but they also offer hope for renewal. So community in the global realm, it's a goal. We are building it now, but we are likely never to fully realize it. So I really welcome your uh, comments. This is work in progress, preliminary thinking in response to the last two days of engagement, as well as my last 10 years of trying to experiment with these kinds of collaborations that I think hold implications for your work as students and teachers in classroom settings beginning to experiment with the digital as well. So, obrigada.